Elementary, dear data, a matter of honor, the measure of a man, and shades of gray. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh <laughs> Rule with Sorak Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing our Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2 review special. This is like raging through all of season two. Some say it's the best season of Star Trek ever. Uh, more on that in a moment, especially Shades of Grey. But how you doing today, Sirach? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. sirach has got ready all of his notes this. organized. Yeah, I got my notes here. But I'm also ready to put these seasons behind us <laughs> and get to the good stuff. After this, well, th well, there's plenty of good stuff in here. Uh, <laughs> so let's just get into it, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Please make sure you like this video. Please make sure you are subscribed to the channel. If you're listening in, give us a five-star rating and a nice review. We'd really appreciate it. And remember, if you're listening in, you can watch all of these episodes on YouTube. Just type in The Seventh Rule. If you're watching on YouTube, please go over and find us wherever podcasts are found and subscribe to our podcast and listen to us there. We also have The Seventh Rule 2. That's The Seventh Rule with the number two where we cover all new Star Trek like Discovery, Lower Decks, Strange New Worlds, Picard, and Prodigy. All right. So first things first, season two kicked in. It was a rocky first season, but we had Denise Crosby to walk us through it, to get us through it, to hold our hand, to keep us having fun. Season two comes in yeah. and the first episode is The Child, in which Deanna is impregnated by an unknown, unknown alien life form. And we're introduced for the first time to Dr. Catherine Pulaski. We've got Pulaski joining in. We've got Guinan mm -hmm. joining in. Uh, Crush, Beverly Crusher is gone. There's just all this new stuff. It's like a fresh new start. What'd you think? <clears throat> yeah. Um, Guinan's hat jumped out to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, this was the episode. Um, we also had a little bit more of Colomini, some more Chief O'Brien in this uh, first episode. But uh, that was yeah, the only yes. Yeah. And the, the thing that jumped out in this episode. I don't know. It was hard for me to believe the whole child it happening that fast in the way it happened. You know, it, it, it from start to finish. And the in camera kind of climbing up Deanna's yeah. body slowly. It, it was a little weird. It was, it was a little weird. Um, I also remember how alone I, I kind of recall Deanna feeling in that moment because it was like she went through that whole pregnancy by herself. It was like Riker was like. Oh, you're pregnant? All right, whatever. All right, I'm going to be busy <laughs> over here then. Oh, oh, suddenly, boy, I got to work double shifts for the yeah. next 18 years. <laughs> I'm signing up for the away missions. Yeah. So I got a captain got, got C on a, a new weird. ship. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. So that was kind of weird. Um, but I did like the introduction to Guinan. I started off also with a... Um, kind of an animosity towards Dr. Pulaski and uh, because I had an, an attachment already at that point with Dr. Crusher. So I yeah. did kind of, you know, was standoffish about her in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot of new characters were introduced. I remember that was what hit me too. Yeah. Uh, Chief O'Brien, Pulaski, Guinan. You know, it's sad about losing Crusher, but kind of like, wow, we're it's it's a show that's expanding. It's growing really excited i'm thinking oh we're gonna see so much of these characters but we kind of really didn't uh the second one was episode two where silence has lease the enterprise encounters a mysterious void in space and when they move in closer to investigate further it envelops them and they can't get out this felt like an original series episode to me uh what was the name of this episode where silence has lease Oh, yeah. Yeah, it did feel like original series episode. Uh, this one, what I remember were the aliens in this, because I drew a couple of them. One was like a little pumpkin head guy. And I think that's... Uh, yeah, the fight, the fight simulator. Scene. Yes, you're right. Yes. So that's what I remember from that episode. Um, it did feel like an original 
series episode had that kind of feel of the just the way the sets were designed a little just designed and film um but also i want to go back to that first episode uh favorite line and i just remembered it in my notes is uh data data what's the difference he's like one is my name the other is not that was so (laughs) good yeah what's the difference well one is my name that (laughs) yeah that it's literally that simple (laughs) yes keep it like that yeah uh not a ton about where silence has least felt the original series to me it was interesting it was fun it was cool but you know nothing horribly memorable from it just a good solid episode but what was memorable to me was elementary dear data because now data is being sherlock holmes and he creates the program character professor moriarty well came from uh sherlock holmes the the story but he you know he has that program and Moriarty, as we know, comes back later on in Picard, and he's kind of an arch nemesis um, in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle books, but also in Next Generation. Yeah, um, I I did like this episode. Um, it was interesting. It it brought in that um, like Sherlock Holmes kind of feel. Is that what we saw yeah. in this episode? And and that became became a thing later on, and it also became a thing later later on in other shows when you had uh, Bashir, for example, playing like the James Bond character. So totally. So the idea of getting into a simulation world and and you know it being um, completely indulged in it is, is, is something that actually la- lasts for a while and. Uh, Shout out to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Brian Allen Lane, who wrote that one. Mm-hmm. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote uh, Sherlock Holmes initially. So they, when they're pulling all, basically, they just said, all right, this is your story. Yeah. We're going to put it into a Star Trek story. And yeah, you're right that this kind of is the first time that they're really going deep. I mean, I guess Picard did something in the holodeck too, but this is really going deeper into that, you know, with where Bashir and O'Brien really, you know, they do the Battle of Midway or something like that. And and Kira and Dax were like Maid Marian or I don't remember exactly what they did, but they were like princesses in one episode where they meet Worf and they're pulling off their hats. So a lot of fun. Yeah. This, this kind of helped to grow the whole holodeck that, uh, fantasy. The, yes, program. the whole holodeck fantasy program. Even if you far go as far as... Uh, lower decks and the whole mark twain the twaining of the you know characters that is lent that still borrows from this kind totally. of idea right so, totally and yeah. speaking of lower decks uh the next episode is season two episode four the outrageous okana uh now okana is a character that came back in star trek prodigy and star trek lower decks so he was a weird yeah. character he shows up Everybody's fallen in love with him. Boys, girls, adults, children, doesn't matter. And I was watching it like, why does this work? It doesn't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some people are like, oh my God, he's so dreamy. But when I watched him, I was like, I don't know. Kind of seems weird. What did you think? Um, Wasn't that taken away with the episode? Surprised that it, you know, becomes like this big lure for some character that continuously kind of finds itself back in the mix. Um, I drew uh, Captain O'Connor's engine core because I thought it looked really cool. Whoever did the the graphics for that or the design build for that, it had that dome in the middle and it Mm -hmm. looked like a little gyroscope type of cool thing. Also, remember, yeah, the thing that he was carrying around, yeah. Yeah, here's the here's my little drawing of it. But um, and then Whoopi's iconic hat, this hat right here became something that stood out and, uh, you know, you'll always remember for me. Um, but yeah, no, nothing too crazy to take away from this episode. Um, you know, Mostly. It, it, yeah, it didn't do that well as far as ratings, I see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mostly just the iconic character. Uh, yeah. The Outrageous Okana is a character that is well-remembered and, you know, came back again in two different series. So he's definitely iconic. I think that's the biggest takeaway from that episode. And the next one is 
this one was really oh, interesting. Uh, uh, take takeaway line from that too, by the way, is data saying my timing is digital. That's one of the great <laughs> takeaway lines. Yeah, that's what Tasha Yar said. Um, episode five was loud as a whisper. And this one was really interesting because it introduced a character who speaks through three characters. The actor himself was deaf. The character was deaf. And it introduced this kind of interesting thought of like, he's speaking telepathically to these three people and these three people, their lives are devoted to communicating for him, which could set up some pretty awkward situations, but it was an interesting idea. And it was really cool that Star Trek was trailblazing and saying, look, we're going to have a deaf character. We're going to have a deaf actor playing it. You know, these are all very cool and important things uh, in an episode. Yeah. yeah. And that's one thing that they do, um, you know, pretty much consistently on Star Trek is take, uh certain kinds of nuances and and really expand upon them um this was a clever idea of having uh, i remember there was like different emotional sides of him one was like the mm -hmm. the angry version of him and one was like the the romantic artic uh, artistic side of his personality who spoke for that uh side of him um the only problem i had with this episode was there was little or no identity given to the people who spoke for the the deaf person in this episode. I felt like those characters should have given been given more backstory. Um, we should have known more about their lives, the sacrifice that either they're willing to make the sacrifice to be this vessel of communication or they are unwilling or you know what what is their existence about and what fulfills them? You know, um also, that was the episode. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned it then. I meant to. I think I may have forgotten that uh, the wife of a famous Star Trek actor played uh, one of the characters. I think it was Harmony. Um, mm -hmm. And her name is Marnie Mossiman, right? If I'm pronouncing that correctly. And she is the wife of John Delancey, which is really fun oh, and interesting okay. and not very well known. I remember seeing that and, and I don't remember if we mentioned it in the episode, but yeah, so his wife, Marnie, was in yeah. that Next Generation episode and she was Harmony. She was like the sweet lady of the three people. I think it was two guys and her. So that's just an yeah. interesting little tidbit for everybody out there to enjoy. The next one was the schizoid man. Remember, this was a weird one. A dying antisocial scientist unintelligent, unintentionally comes upon the perfect vessel in which to perverse, pr preserve his intellect and arrogant personality. Data. Remember, he, he was living alone with one lady. And I think he was like in love with this lady, but she was super young or much compared to him. And then he inhabited Data's body. And it's all it's obvious to all of us that he did that. But for some reason, it's not obvious to any of them. And then Data starts acting all snicker, snicker, tee hee and flirty. And I'll do whatever I want and all this kind of stuff. I remember that was a strange one, but a lot of people really liked it. Yeah, um, it was a little strange. Um, it, the, the, the doctor was Ira Graves. Yeah. Uh, this molecular cybernetics guy. Um, but yeah, I thought it was weird. Uh, you know, what it did show was Data's range. Uh, Brent Spiner has amazing kind of range as an actor to to not only play human size, but also kind of do it with these, this tinge of robotics and android that he's able to do. So the blend is amazing. I really, he's, he's one of the highlights for me of watching the first two seasons is watching Brad Spiner play Data. I think he's just exceptional at it. Um, and it's sometimes it's annoying where you want to do what uh, Picard do, does and say, Data, that's enough. And then sometimes <laughs> it's, it's good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I do remember this one. I um, also remember that uh, 
you know, one of the big lines of this one was a dying man takes the time to mourn a man who will never know death. And that was kind of an interesting play on this this episode, I would say. Definitely. Now, uh, the next episode that we covered was episode seven. Uh, I believe that was Unnatural Selection. Enhanced DNA developments trigger an epidemic of rapid aging caught among its victims is Dr. Pulaski. If you remember, I, this was one that I remember as a kid because it was just, you know, people getting old and it's always kind of weird. And then looking at the weird aging makeup, that's always difficult to do. And then Pulaski's getting old. I'm like, she ain't got a lot of time, man. Hurry. You know? <laughs> and that, and we had a special guest for this episode. It was Dr. Muhammad Noor to explain to all of us that that's not possible to age that quickly, but there was a lot of interesting science that is possible, which Dr. Noor is always great at pointing out. But what'd you think of that one? Uh, really enjoyed it. I thought this was a great episode. Uh, this is the kind of Twilight Zone stories that I like, you know, I, the kick yep. the can type of stories. Um, I thought it was a great, you know, when, when they do science-based stuff, they talked about the Thalusian flu and antibodies and quarantines and outbreaks. This was all kind of stuff that we had gone through recently with the pandemic. So it actually brought back some of those, um, you know, some of those ideas yep. and those things. They talked about sterilite and all of these things. So uh, it brought back things that we were already familiar with. They talked about linear models of viral propagation. These are all kinds of things that we would have, I would have less concern about or even knowledge of had we not gone through the pandemic but go going through that you know raises your antenna and certain keywords and this episode was full of those keywords I actually had omicron in the in the episode you are um, so right you're so right i remember all that because <laughs> four years ago we would be watching these and be like i don't know whatever i don't you know. know but nowadays we're like you better bro you better have a mask on is that n95 yeah, it, it, then it's not worth it. You're not doing anything if it's not N95. Come on, you know, that, you know, we're like, yeah, we're just we're yeah. watching this thing and we're like, I get it, Omicron, watch out. And you know, there's a funny little compilation about how differently they all say Omicron in next in, in, in Star Trek episodes. There's it's like a little compilation where it's like Omicron, 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 oh, and they're just all saying it differently. Super funny, but anyway, that was a that, that's a good point. It did bring back those memories. Uh, the next one yeah. was, speaking of makeup, A Matter of Honor, where we get to meet our very first Benzite. No, no, that was in the first season. That was Mordok. This was the second one. This was Mendon, also played by John Putch. The first one was this guy, Mordok, my good buddy. Mm -hmm. And then that was John Putch. And then John Putch comes to play his brother, Mendon, and then Wesley Crusher makes the thing thing like, hey, Mordok. He's like, I am Mendon. And Wesley's like, oh, shoot, I guess all you guys don't look all the same. Or, or you do. I don't know. But it was pretty bad. But it was a great episode. I liked it very much. It was very memorable from back in the day when I was a kid. We also had Mr. Michael Westmore uh, joining us to talk about the makeup and all of his tireless work making this amazing you know, character and all the Emmys he wins for it. Uh, what did you think of it? uh yeah i mean it was fun to have uh you know michael westmore come and talk about you know the challenges that he kind of faced in the early seasons of uh next generation and how he created on the fly um very good stuff i also think that we got to see a klingon bird of prey in this episode which was also a highlight for me one of the things i i, I drew in this episode um, because it, it just the way the ship looked was super cool. Here's my rendition of that Klingon bird of prey right there. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. they also had some kind of subatomic bacteria kind of plot line in this episode as well. So that was mm -hmm. add, added to the science of it. But, um, but yeah, it was a good episode. Yeah, very memorable. Uh, definitely one of the most memorable of the second season, I believe. And a lot of people really like it, um, including myself. The next one, episode nine, speaking of an episode people like, this is, according to IMDb, 
a top rated episode. It's a 9.1. That might be the highest rated next generation episode. Certainly one of them, certainly one of the, the highest rated of the early ones. Uh, we had two yeah. special guests joining us. We had our good buddy co-host Denise Crosby coming back for this one. And we had the writer of the episode, Melinda M. Snodgrass joining us. Huge episode, right? Yeah, this was a big uh, episode. Um, this uh, we had poker in this episode, right? This is Melinda yes. Snodgrass gave us the, the the sitting around playing poker. I love Data's visor that he was wearing, that little glass kind of looking hat, uh, poker hat. Um, we got references to the Stargazer um, from Picard and kind of a little bit of his backstory there in this episode. Um, and yeah, just very good. It was about the the rights of data, um, mm -hmm. about him not being treated like property, but being treated like uh, uh, a human or a yeah. person, somebody who's uh, you know um, a living, breathing individual. So this was about this really had um, elements of civil rights. Um, you know, of about, you know, a lot of the struggles that black people went through in, in, in America kind of were incited um, feelings wise while mm -hmm. watching this episode for me. Absolutely. This is a lot of people consider this to be the best episode of Next Generation ever. It's amazing that that happened in the second season. That's why it's such an anomaly. It kind of takes you aback. You're like, wow, how did they come up with something so good in the second season, which was pretty choppy? Um, yeah. But the next one is episode 10, The Dauphin, where uh, Wesley falls for the young future leader of Dalid 4. This was the one where she had the old lady with her and she they turn into Ewoks, then they turn into a Wookiee, and then they, they're they like fighting Worf, and then like Worf kind of flirts with the old lady, and you're like, are they, will they, won't they, and we don't get <laughs> them, we don't get them to hook up, but you never know yeah. what might happen in the future. That one was kind of... Yeah, weird. And coming off of such a good episode prior to this, this was a little bit of a, you know, a dip on the roller coaster. So yep, you you got such a great episode with Measure of Man, and, and going back to that a little bit, I want to bring back Guinan's scene where she has that scene with Picard in Ten Forward, where she kind of brings up the fact that oh, you know, disposable creatures that do the dirty work, and Picard says slavery. You mean like slavery? Um. Totally. I thought it was I thought it was very good and excellent um, acting on Whoopi Goldberg's part uh, as mm -hmm. well. So I just wanted to make sure I highlighted that. Um, but yes, this episode, I I just I the, the funny once she turned into that funny little creature and stuff. Uh, <laughs> that's when they lost me. There it goes right there. That's all I need to say. About that episode. That's really good, though. Like you, you really you do these little doodles, but they're very clear what they are. Like it's that's spot on. <laughs> So moving yeah. on to the next guy is episode 11, Contagion. We had our good buddy, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, joining us uh, to talk about some of those guys. What were those guys? I already forgot what they're called, but the, uh, I can't remember. The Iconians. Thank you. No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the Iconians, which we've talked about in other series as well. So Dr. Trek gave us all of his great knowledge on that one. Do you remember that one? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. I yeah. remember the idea was this kind of ro galactic Rosetta Stone that was able to like, right, um, translate culturally. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Um, the, the line that I remember as a takeaway was China was a myth until Marco Polo. That was a Picard line. And yeah, there was a lot of uh, mythology in there. It made me think of the Egyptian civilization and um, Atlantis and all of those kinds of things. Totally. Um, so yeah, uh, it was interesting stuff there. Yeah, this is the, the episode where we got the line: "The knitter isn't working, though." And I, I'll oh, never forget that. <laughs> that's that's the one, huh? The knitter's not working. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Moving on, uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to take a very quick break, everybody. That is the first half of season two. The second half gets crazy. 
So stick around. We will be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Ciroc Frickin' Lofton. Hello, hello. Here are the trivioids of the week. And that's all of those. Moving on, no trivioids. <laughs> uh, episode 12 of season two, as we go through our full season two of the Next Generation review special. Episode 12, The Royale. This one is such a mixed bag to me because some people love it. Some people hate it. I don't like these kinds of episodes generally, but there were definitely some really good takeaways from it. Like I liked the nugget, the seed of the story. It was a really good, it was a really good seed of an idea. Yeah. So it's very yeah. mixed bag for me. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it seemed like it was going to be really good. You know, they found that like piece of a, uh, a NASA shuttle. And I was like, oh, this is like, totally. you know, this, this is the, this is the stuff that I love, you know, where it's a mystery and where did this come from? And, you know, and, and, you know, how are they going to, you know, what, how's the story going to unfold? And then it goes into the whole Mickey D's. Oh yeah. And, Mickey D's and Bergie remember K that? and KFC. Yeah. And and it just became, uh, it became that part of it became a little bit cheesy for me. It, it just didn't sell Royale good for cheese, me. Yeah, yeah. I just I just <laughs> that's where it started to lose me. Uh, there were some great moments though. I thought they, 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 you know, this lost colonel that was living in this hotel or wherever. I thought they could have. There was something there that I wanted to see, but. It just didn't turn out right. The book, there was a book that was found in the dresser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the you know the Royale, I guess Hotel Royale. Um, but yeah, I just it just didn't blend well for me. Um, it seemed like it was a bunch of little pieces of an episode that they try to fit together, and it just didn't forge well, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree, and it's all subjective, but to me. I feel like it had some really interesting elements, but it also had some other elements that were a little weird or a little off. And I would have liked to see it kind of focus more on some things, but you know, again, it's, it's all subjective. Other people really love the stuff that I'm not interested in and aren't as interested in what I love. But the next one was time squared. Now this is a memorable one because it's the one with two captain Picards and one is from like the future. And they're trying to wait for, their time to align with his time and he's phasing and the science of that. I don't even understand how like it, how they can catch up with his time because he's still experiencing time, but whatever, that's just timey wimey stuff as the French say, what do you think of it? <laughs> um, I, I like this. This episode, mm -hmm. this is where they found that other little shuttle craft. Was it that other shuttle? Right. Where Picard was in it. Another Picard. Yeah. Yes. And yes. And he was um, injured and couldn't talk. That, that was the difficulty. You know, he was, they were trying to revive him and he wanted to say something. And then the other Picard figured out that, you know, he had to take some drastic action and jump in the shuttle and do something or something like that. But um, I actually like this episode. Another one that reminded me of a, a Twilight Zone uh, totally. feel. This is, you know, just those kinds of feels where you're like, oh, this is like a, a time loop or some kind of weird, you know, um, alternate universe laid upon this universe kind of, you know, episode. Um, we got the Egyptian American uh, space geologist. Uh, Farouk El Baz, which the um, was who the little shuttle craft was named after, it was right. called the El Baz. Mm -hmm. Um, so just little shout outs like that are why I think the details matter when you watch uh, Next Generation. Those kinds of details people put a lot of thought into, and the fact that they resonate mm -hmm. over all these, these years uh, makes a difference for me. Good point. You know, it's not just the writer and the actors, there's so many people adding so many elements and sometimes there's some really cool nuggets and people are really trying to add some important and some interesting things in there and it's important to catch those now the next one 
was, what do you think when I do this? Uh, a Ferengi thing? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Everybody just watching. Uh, I was obviously doing the great Ambo oh, Jitsu the, battle. The Ambo Jitsu, the Q tips, the giant yeah, the, Q tips. The giant Q tips. This was the Icarus Factor, uh, episode 14 with Riker and his dad. His dad giving him tough love. Uh, uh, Catherine Pulaski, Dr. Pulaski is super flirty with them. They have a pass. And it's one of those moments where you're like, yeah, Pulaski, you go handle your business, man. And by then, we're starting to like her more. She's not, you know, just this, yeah. this sour, you know, replacement of Beverly Crusher. But she's actually, you know, she's got depth. She's, you know, she's out there controlling her own life and being her own baddie. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like I was she started she was she, by this point, she had started to really grow on me. And I did like her kind of like, hey, mind your own business. Yeah, I hooked up with your dad. So what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of like that. Uh, and I thought the guy who played um, Riker's dad, to me, reminded me a little bit of Gene Roddenberry himself. So I mm-hmm. I always wondered if they cast somebody that looked like Gene, you know. Because <laughs> Gene was like. <laughs> Man, I sure would like to hook up with Diana Maldar. So I'm going to get a character that did. And maybe, I don't know. Exactly. But it was exactly. fun. And, you know, we get Anbo Jitsu, which is, if nothing, nothing else, it's memorable. Now, the next one yeah. was also memorable, Pen Pals. This is where Data is communicating with the little girl. And he makes a friendship with her. And then he goes into her home unannounced and tells her parents to keep it a secret. And it's all, there's like these weird elements to it that kind of <laughs> yeah. maybe react a little weirdly, but overall it's supposed to be a very sweet story. It's a nice story. And the bottom line is that we see a softer side to data and he makes a friend and, you know, that's really cool in his, in his story arc. Yeah. They, they were trying to give some, um, some backstory on data and give him something that made uh, made him seem more human. Um, and I think that that was what they were trying to accomplish with this. The, it didn't make it a little awkward that it was this kid that whose parents weren't there. And it was kind of a weird thing. Like call me when your parents are not there. Like, no, don't do that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I can see that it came from a, a good place uh that they were trying to accomplish and and the story really was about i thought was about um you know whether they had the right to intervene or not because that's one of the the main protocols in star trek is right is like uh prime directive w- yep. the prime directive is like you know should we intervene or not and i think uh this particular story ended with her memory being erased or something to that degree so she wouldn't remember that data had saved her life or whatever and brought her closer to her parents or whatever it was Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, i do remember that there was a singing stone that was given to the girl and that stone would remind her of of the the memory that was erased i thought that was a, a, a another clever touch small detail but it it makes for good writing that's really cute um so a lot of people actually really like this episode uh the next one is one that almost everybody loves it is another top rated episode it was an 8.9 on imdb which is extremely high for the second season it's q who episode 16 this is maybe the third time that they see q And Q is acting impish and weird. And so he says, oh, let me teach you a lesson or exert my dominance or whatever he does. Snaps his finger. They're 7,000 light years away. They meet the board. But what really, to me, made this episode really good. First of all, we had our special guest, Dan Curry, who worked on the Mm -hmm. designing and the conceptualizing of the Borg, the Borg uh, cube and everything and what it looks like. Really cool. He's an amazing guest. But... The music was great. The design was great. The directing was great. It was just this all around high quality episode. Yeah. And um, you got a taste of the key of the Borg, you know, Mm. and 
w- one thing that was good is I felt like um, Q wasn't as obnoxious as he sometimes comes across in other episodes. I felt like in this episode, he actually was really uh, warning them of an upcoming danger, which would be the board and, you know, letting them know this is, this is your biggest problem. I know you guys think it's the Klingons and the Romulans. I think that's his his line. Yeah. You judge yourself by the pitiful adversaries you've encountered thus far, the Romulans, the Klingons, they're nothing compared to what's waiting. And that's basically a good thing for the audience too, because the writers are giving us the audience, like, you know, a, a, a Christmas gift that's wrapped up, but it's like under the tree and you know, it's coming. So you're like, well, what is it? You know, yeah. and you're like, you're looking at the box and you're like, Oh, it's a, it's a board cube. Okay. <laughs> but you know, sure enough, it, it's going to be, you know, a big part of the storyline coming forward. So I thought this was a great usage of Q. Yeah. There was um, definitely a message in there, which was, yeah. which was great. Uh, the next one was, for my money, another very memorable one from when I was a kid because I thought it it introduced an interesting concept. This was the Samaritan Snare. The concept was, you know, take your enemies seriously. You know, don't judge a book by its cover. Whatever you really want to pull out of that, it was, oh, these guys are dumb. They don't know anything. And whoops, your overconfidence did you in. And Worf was right for once. You got to be careful and you shouldn't underestimate people we had a very special guest robert mccullough who wrote the episode brilliantly i believe uh what'd you think yeah i did like this episode this is about not underestimating people or your enemies or your adversaries you know you go into a fight you think you're too confident yeah um you know then you you're going to get humbled and i think the the uh crew of the enterprise was humbled Worf was trying to warn them um, he's like, why do we need to send our lead engineer, you know, Jordy, <laughs> yeah. to go help them when we could do it, you know, another way? We could send and, Wes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or that other ensign that we had a couple episodes ago. Yeah. Nobody, uh, Selma, was it Gomez? Ensign Gomez? Oh, yeah, Sonia uh, Gomez. Sonia send Gomez. Over. Send so- <laughs> she just spills coffee on everybody. Who cares? Her hot chocolate. So, yeah, they, they could have. So this was a great um uh, episode um i really liked it i thought yeah i liked it i enjoyed this episode a lot yeah Mm -hmm. now the next one was and remember remember also robert mccullough did share the writer did share with us that the uh, origin of this idea was carjacking carjackings that were happening in los angeles right and so that's you know that that's where the pack leads were doing. They were doing a, a modern day car. Totally. They're like, oh, my car's broken now. Can you help me? And you're, you're like, yeah, sure. And they're like, ha ha, sucker. That's yeah. what you get for being a good Samaritan. That's why it's called Samaritan Snare. Now the next one, yeah. Up the Long Ladder. Uh, this one is memorable for a couple reasons. Number one is, why did they have to transport the hay over? They transported all these old Irish pe- farmers or whatever, but... They transport the hay. Okay, I get the animals, I get the people, but hay, you don't need it. But the other one was that the lady was showing ankle cleavage and she's like, she kind of like hikes up her skirt to show a little ankle and calf and Riker was like, I am in for it. And they had a very adult relationship. Dr. Muhammad Noor was our guest to talk about the science aspect, not the ankle cleavage. What do you think? <laughs> um. Was this wasn't the like the this was the, the like the Irish, yes, uh, vagabonds that they found and brought aboard mm-hmm. the ship. Yeah, um, a little bit too over the top on the stereotypes. I felt on the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the old Irish villagers or whatever they were. Um, I felt it was over the top on the stereotypes. The thing that I walk away with the most is that uh, Riker is horny again. It was like. I think he has a contract where he gets three horny moments or so per season. <laughs> this was one of them. <laughs> so, yeah. But that's you know, what the, I remember. The lady that played that that character was actually kind of a standout because she wasn't oh, given she was phenomenal. a ton, but she did a great job with it. We really, we really appreciated her work. She was great. 
Yeah. And Riker also appreciated her, but for different reasons, probably. <laughs> uh, the next one was episode 19, Manhunt. Manhunt. And uh, this one is memorable because uh, Majel Roddenberry, what are you laughing at? <laughs> I know what you're laughing at. Majel Roddenberry <laughs> is back. So it's great to see Majel, but we also see Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac playing an ant. Tedian, I think those fish head guys. And at the end, remember yeah. they're like scooping up the fish and making all those gross sounds. And it's like the camera's on them for way too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I remember about this episode. <laughs> it's hard to get away from that. Um, this was about uh, sex drive as well, which is, this is back to back sex related kind of stories or sex drive related stories. Cause this was, um, Luat Sana Troy um, going through something called the phase, which is kind of uh, a moment in which betazoids become super horny and they're looking to mate or be, you know, hook up with somebody. So that was interesting, um, the, the, the uh, science behind that to explain that. But also was uh, great was the makeup job done on the Antedians or the, and yeah, the Antedians. I thought it was you know, they did have an unusual costume. I remember the kind totally. of, you know, shut you know, the round curtain type thing yeah. that they were wearing. Personal um, shower curtain kind of personal thing. shower curtain. Yeah. And their fish like faces and facial features. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's one of the big takeaways from that. Right. And the next one was a misnomer makes us think of Deep Space Nine, the emissary. This is episode 20, the emissary. But it's really Kalar who shows up. She's kind of a love interest for Worf, uh, played by Susie Plaxon, who also played Dr. Salar, who we find out was intended to be a love interest to Worf. So I think they just wanted uh, Susie Plaxon and Michael Dorn. And they're like, we'll just keep coming up with characters for Susie until we can get her to hook up with Worf. Uh, what did you think of that? Uh, yeah, um, you know, it didn't really stick out to me that much. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's not there's not much. Was the Who played in this episode? Yeah, I think so. At one point, uh, I don't remember what point, but mm. you know, so there was yeah. that. I mean, that's really what stands out to me is just the character being introduced. You know, Kalar. Yeah. You know, and that that's was cool. It. Yeah. Uh, the next one was all right. Everybody listening in, sorry, you're going to miss this one, but it was this one. Everybody watching but, right oh, now. But but Kalar was half Klingon. So yes. that was the so they did deal with the multiracial, uh, a multiracial person from a different aspect, a non-human multiracial person, but a Klingon human uh interracial person. Right. So I thought that was that was an interesting point. Right and they did it well. And this yeah. is peak performance, everybody knows. Uh <laughs> I forgot what the alien character's name was. He was a Zach Dorn. The aliens called a Zach Dorn. And yeah. it was uh, Serna Kolrami was the character name. And they play war yeah. games. You remember that one? Yeah. Because uh, he gave me Kai Wynn vibes. That guy was <laughs> kind of creepy a little bit. And uh, I remember... Um, Pulaski having a nice connection with Data in this episode, kind of like when she, you know, try to tries to charm him into playing against uh, the, you know, the Stratagema game against this Zach Dorn mm -hmm. character. So uh, I did like the chemistry that she had with Data because remember we started off the season with her being really kind of rude to Data, totally, and and we at this point now see that she treats him with respect. She, you know, she she talks to him and. She's actually intrigued by his um, uh, capabilities um, and wants to exploit those in this particular uh, episode. So, hey, Data, you have this ability. You're smarter than everybody. You're right. able to you know, process this amount of information. Use it to beat this guy. And so uh, we got the idea in this episode, which is he didn't play to win, but he played to not lose. And that's you play to win the game <laughs> and data goes nah because a tie is a win in this right. in this scenario it was yeah he defeated yes. the zach dorn in that regard because the zach dorn then quit 
Also, the tactician in the episode was played by David L. Lander, who everybody knows is Squiggy of Lenny and Squiggy and Laverne and Shirley. So that was cool. Now, the last episode was. Okay, got to do it. Shades of Grey, everybody. Shades of Grey. Uh, our special guest was Eric Stilwell who was a production assistant at the time and who was tasked with the job of collecting all of the, the film and all the tapes and going through all of it and helping out the director there. He was an amazing guest. That was the best part of it. But honestly, this episode, which I always thought was the worst episode ever, ever since I saw it when I was a kid, wasn't as bad as I remember it. The science and medicine seemed pretty good. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, who's an MD, said the, the medicine was good. The science is good. If you go in expect yeah. it to be terrible, it won't be too bad. Yeah. Um, really kind of a lackluster episode for a season finale. Because this is a, this is the final episode, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And usually the season finales end with... Um, like, you know, fighting scenes or, you know, action scenes or war or battle or some kind of higher stakes on the line. I, I, they did have Riker's life as, you know, that was the stake on the line, and particularly in this episode. I think Riker was, you know, his survival and, you know, was kind of being questioned whether he would live or die. And he was trying to go out like a soldier. He said, I'm going to go out like, you know, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to die, uh, you know the way go being myself and doing it the way I want to do it. Um, but I did like uh, Marina Sirtis in this episode. She had a lot of acting to do with facial expressions yeah. and, and I thought she was really good in this episode, even though she's not, she's not given that much to do, but in this particular episode, I felt like she did love Riker. She, she conveyed that emotion of feeling like she was lost and, uh, mm -hmm. hopeless in some moments. So I did uh, like that part. And I, it wasn't as bad as pe yeah. people said it was, it was going to be. It was actually kind of fine. I mean, it wasn't great, but it was fine. Not for a season yeah. ender. That's for damn sure. But, you know, it was well, okay. I, I can see the clip, the, the over usage of clips was probably the problem. The yeah. biggest problem. With this Usually that the season ender has like big budget. This had like no budget. <laughs> it was the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was all clips, yeah. But we do want to thank very quickly some of our friends before we move on to the next segment. And their names are Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England, out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson, Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. <laughs> Arukin. Our pal Titus Muller, uh, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jake. Jane Jorgensen. Yeah, we like Jake and Jane. Yeah. Uh, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfee, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got the free-for-all next. we got a lot more to talk about. This thing's crazy. It's like boom, 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 boom. It's going to be chill on the other side. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Frickin' Loft. And wearing his Seventh Rule shirt, by the way, everybody, that you can get yeah. by clicking on the link in the description box below. Just click on our uh, Teespring store and get your very own seventh rule shirt that's got a self-sealing stem bolt on it you can get it in any size and color all right it's time for the free-for-all let's see we don't have to guess any imdb scores there are no non-appearance mentions but on the plus side melissa longo is here hi <laughs> all right we are also joined <laughs> by uh greg K. Wickstrom. We've got Tierney C. Diekman. My L in Tokyo. We've got Carrie Schwent, Chris McGee, and of course, Allison Leach Hyde. Cool shirts by... Ooh, actually, Mai's got a 
really cool color of her trailblazer shirt that she got at the introverted Republic. Uh, All right. So Melissa, can you please get us started off? Here are the two questions to tackle. Number one, what was your favorite episode of season two and why, but also what was your favorite moment of season two? Ah, oh, dude. Ah, <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, my favorite episode is easy, easy peasy, because it's one of my favorite episodes um, of Star Trek is uh, the measure of a man. <laughs> Look. <laughs> uh, the measure of a man because it was awesome um so many great moments in that episode um favorite moment i don't know favorite moment that's a difficult one the, the first moment that springs to mind is fingers <laughs> yeah stratagemma yeah i, I don't Strata know if Jama. that's my favorite moment but that's the one that popped into my head so i'm gonna throw that one out there <laughs> interesting is it stratagemma or stratagemma i don't remember Gemma. i think in spanish it's stratagemma but i'm not sure <laughs> well we'll have to ask the expert Gregory K. Wickstrom is here. What's up, Greg? What's your favorite episode of season two? And what was your favorite moment overall? What's up? That's a tough question. Um, Let's say I was looking through the episode list a little earlier. And, you know, season two isn't as bad as people say. Like, there are a lot of good ones in this this season. Season one, it's definitely way better than season one. Um, I'll go with Elementary Dear Data. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Like, huge. I been, was recently in London. Went to the Sherlock Holmes Museum, and I, I loved it. You know? um, so, and I think my favorite moment is from that as well. Um, sorry. Ooh. Sounds People like are laughing house. in the background. <laughs> People are laughing <laughs> in the background. It's lunchtime here. Anyway. Yeah. It, when they go into the holodeck and they recreate Victorian London and you see Data doing his impression. It's just, it's beautiful. You know, mm-hmm. uh, there are a lot of other great moments, but I'll keep it at that. Thanks. Good stuff. Thank you very much for that. And welcome Faith Howell, by the way. Hello. Uh, Tierney C. Diekman is here. What's your favorite episode? Is it Shades of Grey? And what's your favorite moment? I'm sorry, Shades of Grey. I've never heard of that episode. This season oh, only had 21 best. episodes. <laughs> um, I, 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 God Almighty. I mean, okay. So, I, I, I sat out a lot of these uh, because of of being sick and uh, that gave me a nice, unique opportunity to basically go back and just binge them all straight through over a couple of days and uh my husband and i sat down and we rewatched through these it's it's been a little while to watch through season two and we were kind of having a raucous good time because it's it gets it gets pretty ridiculous some of these bits uh and it's it's maybe a little easy but you know it kind of it falls between Q who and and elementary dear data in this just the the start the overall ominousness of the borg and obviously there's some lore issues there but i mean given what they had to work with with really bringing in a new big bad uh it's a it's a great start and kind in and moments there with their with that that posture but Elementary Dear Data, it has to be a favorite there just for the overall entertainment factor and its ridiculousness. And I love Picard like, oh, I better go change into, you know, so I suit so we don't um, 
alarm the other people in the holodeck. Not that I totally don't have this entire cosplay outfit and this top hat, you know, the pop out top hat ready to go. Um, but, uh, you know, Daniel Davis uh, is he's great. And he he makes you by by by, you know, halfway through with him as he's changing you you feel for him his performance is is wonderful and um you know going through then as well and i was kind of excited to watch through uh measure of a man and we have the the extended version and you know i was just pissed off the whole time i wanted to just slap maddox and slap what's her name the the lawyer space lawyer and it was just making me so angry and 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 hurt and ugh. so is as good as it is is nope can't call it a favorite anymore not in the same way so yeah elementary but oh there are moments i have so many moments written down so many things about season two so i think when the rewatches come i, I might uh i might not go straight to to season three with the Mandarin collars and have to stick with the uh with 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 season two from now on because yeah it's it's another one of those it's not as bad as you as you remember is the hype the negative hype but uh yeah yeah we'll have for things left unsaid so much left unsaid agreed definitely better than than we remember it it seems in a lot of ways my is live in tokyo who is just as amazing as we always remember her to be there are you thank you <laughs> what did you um uh what what's your favorite what did you think was your favorite episode and favorite moment i got four so i'm gonna get to that in one second i just want to say that the, the the background i've got up i don't know if any of you guys are remember who jamarcus russell was oh, he was yeah. a massive flop that was in the nfl lowest touchdowns regards passing completion percentage he stunk out loud um and so i thought it would be appropriate to, and his number was two so i thought it would be appropriate to put that up on the screen call this the jamarcus here um <laughs> you know, i think i think it's interesting I, I averaged out all the imdb scores for each of the years and this one had this season had the second lowest uh imdb score of 6.9 across the whole the season um and i didn't balance it out for 22 versus 25 versus 26 episodes but yeah 6.9 it's it's not it's not there but there are a lot of reasons but like on the football field that's just excuses you have to get better basically um it wasn't but it wasn't all bad um i thought in this season for what it was there were still some of the most poignant episodes or or moments um and i got i have four as i say i can't narrow it down to just one um, and some are for entertainment value and some are for their social bravery and commentary, I thought. Um, so like one of the least well-produced or written episodes, it, it touched my heart the most, the, the real love story of the season, the Dauphin. I love that uh, for, for as a love story. Um, for commentary and provocation of thought, Measure of Man, um, because it addresses head on the ugly reality of racism in America. And I thought that even more commentary came with, with Samaritan Snare because it, it looks at what defines our own value and how we perceive ourselves, which I thought was a pretty heavy, a heavy topic, the way they played it, especially with the way they had the characters look. Um, but, but then wrapping it up, the hippie rocker in me um, loved The Emissary because it uses music from the Who's Quadrophenia uh, album in such an incredibly powerful way. So as I said last week, on to season three. Mm -hmm. great stuff thank you very much my live in tokyo carrie schwent is here we we were talking about you earlier uh <laughs> but what did you think here what was your favorite episode what was your favorite moment season two well a couple of them i'll echo the the elementary dear dear data i don't never really been a huge fan of mysteries but i enjoy sherlock at the, kind of at the at this at the same time murder mysteries don't really do it for me but i enjoy sherlock and anything in a period costume i'm totally here for but the other one that i that i really like that stuck out for me is pen pals is i love data data and sarjenka's 
little relationship in that episode i think it's so adorable especially when she gets when he gets her up up to the ship and just their in person sort of relationship is just so sweet and the yeah the other the other moment that is spread over a cup over a couple of couple of different episodes and also sort of inspired based on a challenge the limerick that that i came up with but when wesley is looking for love advice love advice and he's talking to Worf, and he's the subject of Kling, klingon love poetry comes up and the subject comes up again later with it with work and pulaski so i decided to i came up with a klingon love limerick <laughs> here we go a warrior spirit you possess it sets my heart racing in my chest. The way that you kill gives me such a thrill. Upon a river of blood we shall rest. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. If, Kling, if Klingons wrote love limericks, that that I think would be one of them. <laughs> that was honorable. You write Thank poetry. You very much. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thanks very much, Carrie. Uh, look. Chris McGee is here and he's ready for us. Did you have a favorite episode and a favorite moment? Indeed I do. In fact, I'll re real briefly just mention my, my top three episodes. Number three is Q Who, of course, the origins of the board, which happens to also be my favorite moment of the season when the Enterprise crew finally meet the board for the first time. Number two, Elementary Dear Data, an excellent outing on the holodeck with wonderful costumes, wonderful um, story with uh, Daniel uh, Davis playing uh, Moriarty, just great. And of course, the number one, so you get with me now, everyone, Shades of, I mean, uh, The Aww. Measure of a <laughs> Man. Wonderful courtroom <laughs> drama written by Melinda Snodgrass. I'll save it on my other season two observations for things left unsaid. As for the memorable quote of the season, you know, after all the many dangers of the, the, the Enterprise crew faced this season, especially the board, I kind of sympathize with Pulaski's statement from Where Silence Has Lease. Why do I get the feeling this was not the time to join this ship? <laughs> and then, not to step on Carrie Stowe's, I have a little limerick here that I'd like to present, present to everyone. Let me see if I can bring that up real fast. On the Enterprise, my time is done with a crew that's second to none. In sickbay, I've worked, bantered and smirked. Farewell, my dear friends, the journey's been fun. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. And there we go. Nice. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that called? Never mind. <laughs> just yeah. using, using some AI. <laughs> I'm not saying yeah, that was yeah, actually yeah, yeah, Diana yeah, Moldar's yeah, voice yeah, yeah. or anything. He called her up yeah. on Cameo. Yeah. Voice. Like, yeah, I don't yeah, need yeah, you yeah. to say Shh, hi. Don't give <laughs> <laughs> All right. Up next, we've got our good pal, Faith Howell. Hello, hey. Faith. What's your favorite episode and favorite moment of this glorious season uh, i have a hard time picking a favorite episode but i think um just because i think this season doesn't uh it doesn't stack up against where i know we're going so it you know it seems less fun overall uh however i do feel like there are a lot of um gems in this episode or in this season um, we have um, so many characters that are introduced. Even the one-off characters are very memorable, like Grandpa, um, the teddy bear lady, and um, of course um, <laughs> that that evil guy that tried to to take Data away. I don't remember his name right this second, but you know who I'm talking about. Um, the Royale was super fun, um, and so I think that there are a lot of really cool, memorable moments throughout the season. And I looking at the down the list. Um, you know, I can't pick out one particular episode that's bad per se. I know there are some that are better than others and we all have nitpicks about each one, but, um, you know, if I had to pick one, I, my mind goes to Stratagema 
and and I that that quote that I you know got called out for <laughs> repeatedly, but um, you know being able to uh, to fail or lose losing is not failing I think is what he said. So mm-hmm. that's that I think is the most memorable moment overall to me this season. So. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Faith Howell, uh, Allison Leach Hyde in her radical shirt, Allison. Do you have a favorite episode and a favorite moment in season two of The Next Generation? I really like The Emissary. It's, it's, I love getting more Klingon history and Susie Plaxon is so much fun. She does such a great job. And so I've always enjoyed that episode a lot. Yes, I love Measure of a Man too, if I want a more serious feeling for an episode. And as weird and and however much it didn't reach its potential i love the royale too (laughs) but my favorite moments from this season are all about the the family they're creating you know having breakfast with Riker making everyone the worst omelet anyone has ever seen and (laughs) you know and Guinan you know caring for Wesley and doing that, you know, mirroring him to get him to talk to her. It's those, we're getting a lot more of Jordi and Data's relationship. So that's, that's what I take away from season two is that we're building the relationships and we carry them so much more in the upcoming seasons. So I I love that we're laying the groundwork now and they carry it through. Cause I mean, we, we start with poker and, and dinners together. And I'm glad they're showing the the relationships of of the crew starting in this and that's my favorite part about season two wow great stuff thanks very much allison leach hyde all right jake's final take jake we i mean sorry Sirach. We we, <laughs> we flew through every episode in uh the first two segments but we didn't go over whether we had a favorite episode or a favorite moment. We highlighted some highs and lows. Did you have a favorite episode or two? Did you have a favorite moment? Um, yeah, I, I had some episodes that I liked. I I, I liked the episode. Um, well, I, I definitely think measure man was the best episode of this season. It just, you know, dealt with so many issues um that you know that strike a chord on uh, other topics that are relevant to us in, in our own personal lives so i think that's one that just stands out it's just uh, it's impossible to ignore um but having said that the other moments and episodes that i really liked um i like when Riker was the captain of the klingon ship in uh, a matter of honor mm-hmm. i i enjoyed that a lot i thought it was good to see him kind of get his respect from the klingon crew and also earn his respect with the enterprise and kind of you know making them surrender at the end wink wink you know um i i really enjoyed that i thought it was clever and um it was good good writing and entertaining for me um you know, I also like Dr. Pulaski at the end and the a story arc of her character. Because I remember not giving her the benefit of the doubt in the beginning and kind of like, oh, I'm not going to like you. And I refuse to like you and you don't belong here. And there was a little part of me that was not being fair to her. And over the course of this season, she really won me over. Um, I believed in her professionalism. I believed in her expertise. Um, there were moments where she challenged Picard, I thought, in ways that other people had not, um, as far as pulling his card and saying, hey, look, I'm going to have to, like, you know, 86 you if you keep acting crazy. So there were moments I thought she really stepped up to the plate. I uh, love the way she kind of put Riker in his place when she's when he was like, hey, you never told me about my dad, you and my dad. She's like, yeah, that's none of your business. I'm a grown woman, so I don't have to yeah. tell you anything. Um, so there's moments that I thought, and then also her relationship with Data and how she 
learned to respect data for who he was, which is, you know, part of the measure of a man, you know, why it meant so much too, because we did kind of see him as this robot and you're, you know, you're not, you're not human. You don't have the kind of feelings we have. And then we start to understand that it's more complicated than that. And it's not as simple as it's just, you know, him being a piece of machinery. So I think that all of those reasons why, um, this season has good elements that really grew on me. Um, I did miss Tasha Yar, and I think they could have used her character so much more in this season for so many different reasons and missions. Would have been great to see her expand that character. Um, and, but we also saw a lot of growth from Wesley as well. The first season, I felt like Wesley was like, kind of like, you know, the fifth wheel. And then slowly but surely you see that he really belongs there on that crew. He has uh, value to add to the missions and to the ideas that are being brought to the table. So uh, for that reason, you know, there was a lot of things that grew on me um, in this in this season. Um, and also Guinan. I thought mm. she had mm -hmm. some exceptional moments in this. She was so... Her presence was felt, um, and there, there were moments, for example, I thought she was the star, and uh, yeah. she had the best scene in a measure, uh, The Measure of a Man when she was mm -hmm. talking with Picard about, you know, the disposable creatures. Um, so for that reason, I think, you know, this season definitely left a good impression on me. It was not as bad as uh, I was led to believe that it would be with the exception of a couple of episodes. <laughs> but uh, but for the most part, you know, it got better. Um, it really got better. All the way to the last that, episode, right? Yeah, not, I'm not, I can't vouch <laughs> for the last episode, actually. I just can't do it. Uh, I can, I, I'll say the one before the last was pretty good. The, even the mm -hmm. two before that, the... Uh, the emissary and peak performance, mm -hmm. you know, they were both good. It's just the last episode I wasn't a big fan of only because they just used too many clips and they didn't give us original content. And that's what we want to watch the show for is for original content. Uh, they could have used the whole plant biting Riker and, you mm -hmm. know, all of that stuff was cool mm -hmm. with me. But I just didn't like the flashback so much. Um, and, and, and there wasn't really much of a B storyline. Um, and it could have been more stakes. Uh, the, they could have raised the stakes for me, especially since they had already given us a little Borg sample. That would have been nice to get a little touch of that too, kind of a cliffhanger moment. But for the most part, uh, it still was better than the first season. And also the makeup, uh, the makeup was really spectacular. I think of the Antedians, I think of the uh, the different aliens that we saw, the many Klingons on the episode where there were so many, you know, Klingons in a, a matter of honor, just so many great makeup job. Um, and also we got the concept of playing poker this season, the whole card game. And that's another long lasting kind of, legacy building uh nugget that we get in this season so well, those are my takes yeah we also had some chief o'brien which was yeah. really fun he was always the highlight yeah. every time he popped in <laughs> even though he would just be like say what did i do or he'd say like one line but we like oh man that's chief o'brien and we love him um <laughs> all right that's it for us there's a lot more to, to, to discuss melissa's got three more moments she wants to talk about in things left unsaid so everybody if you are a patron or a backer uh stick around check out the next segment everybody else hey it's been a pleasure we've got some special treats for you next week so enjoy those <laughs> uh thank you very much to melissa longo greg k wickstrom aka greg kenzo allison leach hyde chris mcgee carrie schwent my live in Tokyo, Faith Howell, and of course, Tierney C. Diekman. For myself, Sirach Lofton, 
Aaron Eisenberg. Aaron's like, don't lump me in with season two of Next Generation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, Melissa, did he? Well, we'll talk about that later, actually. I'm curious to know what he would have thought on this. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. We appreciate all of you, and we will see you soon. Until then, always remember the seventh rule.